Brother Danny Douglas is a native of Mount Pleasant, Tennessee. He's been preaching the gospel on a regular basis since 1977, and he served churches of Christ in Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, and Virginia. He's also done full-time mission work in the Ukraine and in the United Kingdom. He worked in public education for about 10 years, where he served as a teacher, a principal, and a college instructor. And now he's involved in business, as well as preaching. He has preached over the radio now for over 20 years and is a teacher with Truth Bible Institute. He's currently the preacher for the Central Church of Christ in Mount Pleasant, Tennessee, the insurance broker. He also is involved in the work of the Lord in the Philippines. He's blessed with a faithful support and a dedicated wife, a wonderful person, I added that, <laughs> and mean it in doing the Lord's work. Laarni Tabalan, Tabalan. Is that right? Did I put it? Okay. Getting the accent sometimes is like trying to do it in Greek. She is a wonderful person that I said a moment ago. They're blessed with two precious children in Lydia and Daniel Moses Douglas. I remember preaching in... Do they still sing that? In the Bible we find... Okay. Now, I just wonder if they... They're little folks when we taught them that, but they, they had to sing it a lot while I was there. And they do a wonderful job. Danny is just a great person in his love for the truth and, and living it in his life. And we appreciate that so very much. I first came across Danny when uh, Brother Dub and us, some others, were over in... UK, when you were just finishing up there, and before you married. So see, when we came over there, we worked a lot of things. You believe that? We broke Ken's job out of Yeah, that's right. I don't know what Ken did. But anyway. Well, that's, that's good. <laughs> you know, when you get around Ken, he's helped get several folks together over there. Husband and wives, too. But he's done a great job, and we loved him and saw his work over there. And he continues. His wife is Filipino. And uh, so he goes over there when he can. Stays as much as nearly a month, don't you? About two weeks, three weeks. Does a great work over that part of the world. So we want to hear him preach now on Christ's confronted error about worship. Brother Danny, come speak to us. I see that clock, Brother Brown. <laughs> you know, the book of Revelation says that the angel stood with one foot in the sea and one on the shore and declared, Time is no more. And here I said, One foot on the shore, one on the step, and he said, Shut up. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank, thank you, Brother Brown. I appreciate the kind words. Uh, that is the first time you spoke to me. Uh, I do appreciate the uh, kind words and uh, appreciate the good prayer that was prayed and the beautiful singing. And uh, I'm so thankful to be here. Uh, thank the Lord for this privilege for each and every one here this evening. It's always a great blessing to be in this lectureship. And with all these sound and faithful gospel preachers, and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ of this congregation and those visiting, thank the Lord for the Spring Church of Christ, a great congregation. So thankful for the godly elders here and uh, Brother Cone, Brother Stevens, and Brother Roth, and so love and appreciate Brother, Brother Brown and what he means to the cause of Christ and to us. And I want to say thank you to Brother and Sister Brown this week for... Uh, lodging me again this year and especially for sister brown i mean but he's hospitable too <laughs> <laughs> both of them are and uh, he has been good enough to share some of his christmas cheese with me though was a bit reluctant but i've enjoyed eating it anyway but uh, we are so thankful to be enjoy being with them every time uh you know i heard the story about, uh, well, I also want to thank all those who work for the lectureship, Sister Sonia and many others 
the good sisters here and brothers who worked so hard. I want to, don't want to leave anyone out. Most of all, we thank the Lord. Uh, I heard a story about these two men on Sunday morning. They went out fishing in the lake, and they could hear the bells tolling in the distance. And it wasn't a cell phone either. And one of them said to the other, we really ought to be in church today. And the other one said, well, I couldn't go anyway. My wife is sick. <laughs> you know, brethren, that's how some people are when it comes to worship. That's their attitude if they can in any way get out of it. So unlike the man after God's own heart, David, who said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Psalm 122, 1. David was not sad when it came time to go to worship God. He was glad. And we certainly hope and pray that's the attitude of each and every one here, even this evening. Now, you know, we're looking at Christ confronting worship, error about worship this evening. Got Christ confronting error about worship. You know, God has a right to make demands as to how He is to be worshipped. After all, we're not the ones being worshipped. We are the worshippers. God has the right as our Creator to demand the kind of worship that we should offer unto Him. And it is not a matter of being hateful or unkind to say that this is exactly what the Lord wants in worship. As we go back to Leviticus chapter 10, we learn that principle from aforetime in verses 1 and 2, how that Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron and nephews of Moses, offered strange fire unto the Lord, and he struck them, and they were consumed with fire right there. Because that's not what God authorized. That's a lesson for us for all time. And that also teaches us that God is no respecter of persons, Acts 10, 34. It doesn't matter what congregation, how influential and large it is, or what college or preaching school or prominent brethren would bring things into the worship of the Lord's church that are not authorized, God is no respecter of persons. Remember that Aaron was the first high priest in Israel. These were his sons that were consumed with fire. And remember, they were the nephews of Moses himself. But now, in John 4, 24, Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, he makes a sweeping statement here, and I say sweeping because it crushes all error on worship. This one statement. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In declaring that God is the one to be worshipped, and he is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Son of God. His Father is the one to be worshipped, according to 1 Thessalonians Chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. He is identified in the Scripture. It's not Allah or some other false god. In this one statement by our Lord, although it is a positive statement, it destroys all error regarding worship. In declaring the true and the living God is the one to be worshipped, that destroys Buddhism, Islam, or any other false religious system. And even those that claim to belong to Jesus Christ, but worship in error, it destroys all denominationalism and Roman Catholicism, Mormonism, the Watchtower Society and Jehovah's Witnesses, destroys all these false religious bodies and their false systems of worship. Because God is the one to be worshipped, he is to be worshipped in spirit, that is, sincerely from the heart with the spirit of man, and in truth according to God's word. So any worship that is not according to the word of God, which is the truth, John 17, verse 17, 
is destroyed by this statement that our Lord made here. Now there's been some things said this week regarding exclusivism and those who want to be inclusive. Consider this fact this evening that Jesus did confront error about worship. That is a fact. He did. He did confront error about worship. And secondly, this fact is a strong statement that how we worship is a matter of eternal importance. It is a matter of eternal importance. Because had Christ not confronted our own worship and not made these statements, then if the New Testament did not authorize how we should worship, then man is free to worship as he pleases, but God has specified how we are to worship. And Jesus Christ has all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. And we are to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, that is, by his authority, giving thanks to God and the Father, by him, Colossians 3 and verse 17. But now let's go to Matthew, the fourth chapter, and we will see here a negative in the sense that Jesus is resisting the temptation of the devil, but he makes a positive statement. In Matthew, the fourth chapter, and of course, this was during the time of the temptations in the wilderness. In verses 8 to 10, again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Here the Lord quotes scripture from Deuteronomy 6 verse 13 in chapter 10 and verse 20. And by the way, for all of us here tonight, children, young people, adults, the Lord gave us a pattern in overcoming the devil here. We are to stand on the word of God. We are to stand on the scriptures. That's the way to resist the devil. To take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, Ephesians 6 verse 17. And all the power that Satan has cannot equal the power in the word of God. Let us remember that. Satan does have a lot of sway and power. But he cannot equal the power of God. Remember what John said in 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That is, greater is Christ and the Christian than Satan and the sinner. Now, the Lord set a great example for us here. But look at the answer that the Lord gave. He said, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. The Lord our God, the true and the living God, is the only one who is to be worshipped. Not human beings, not mere man, not a false God. Now, there's one other thing that we need to remember. And that is what Moses said in Deuteronomy 4.24. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. He also declared that in chapter 5 in verse number 9. God will not tolerate rivalry. God will not allow anyone in his place. You know, this brings up another matter regarding worship, and this relates to worshiping God in spirit. And that is the fact that God will not accept divided loyalty. And you know, we as members of the church need to remember that. That God will not accept those who are worldly in heart. He won't accept their worship. He won't accept the worshiper who comes in with lust and filth and hate and greed and covetousness and envy and bitterness in his heart. He won't accept that. What do we bring to the worship? That's something we need to think about. Paul said, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glo therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. What are we bringing before God into the worship? Paul was jealous over the Corinthians with a godly jealousy. 
In 2 Corinthians 11, he said in verse 3, But I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguile Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. That word simplicity means single-hearted devotion. Now James relates to this matter in James chapter 4, verse 4, when he refers to those who are worldly as spiritual adulterers and adulterers. He doesn't use the word spiritual there, but it's implied just as a man who is unfaithful to his wife is a physical adulterer, or a woman who is unfaithful to her husband is a physical adulteress, those who are unfaithful to God, even in heart, are guilty of spiritual adultery. James said, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. True worshipers are not divided in their loyalties. But as we think this evening regarding Jesus dealing with the matter of having the wrong object of worship, as Satan was not to be worshipped, Jesus resisted the devil's attempt to persuade him to forsake his heavenly father and to cast his allegiance with the prince of darkness. The Lord resisted that. We know that there are those today who want to worship men or false gods. A shocking display of disobedience and blasphemy took place on Sunday night, the Lord's Day of all days, November the 25th, 2012, at the Soul Train Awards of 2012 in Las Vegas, Nevada. This is when actor Jamie Foxx opened up the festivities by saying, First of all, giving honor to God and our Lord and Savior, Barack Obama. Barack Obama. Then amidst the cheering and applauding, he commanded everyone to stand up. Now, where does that lead your mind to? You know where it takes my mind is Acts chapter 12. Over in Acts the 12th chapter, what does the Bible say regarding King Herod? Over in Acts the 12th chapter, Herod was eaten with worms. And he didn't command these people to worship him, but he was ready to accept it, and he didn't correct them. He didn't refuse it. He did not refuse worship. And what did God do? In Acts 12, beginning at verse 21, And upon a set day Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost, but the word of God grew and multiplied. Now how does the Lord feel today when men receive worship? What about the Pope of Rome? Doesn't he receive worship? You know, they claim that uh, Peter was the first Pope, but when Cornelius fell down at Peter's feet in Acts 10, what did Peter tell him to get, do? He told him to get up. I also, myself, I'm a man. You see, Peter was not a pope, and he's not like the popes of today. There's only one God and only one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's one God and Father, and our Lord, Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 8, 6 teaches Matthew 1, 21, he is called Savior. Jesus is. In Titus 2, 13, he is called the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That phrase there, and we know that the Father is God. We understand that. But that phrase is talking about Jesus, the Son. A great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Titus 2, verse 13. We are to worship the Father through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5 and verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Matthew 6 and verse 9. But now let's go to a second passage regarding Christ confronting error about worship. And this is in Matthew the 15th chapter regarding the scribes and the Pharisees, he had already charged them with making the word of God of none effect by their tradition. In verse 6, 
In other words, they put their human tradition above the Word of God. Now, anyone who would be so arrogant and presumptuous as to do a thing like that is deserving of the very thing that the Lord said here. In Matthew 15, beginning at verse 7, The Lord said to them, Ye hypocrites, Well, does his eyes prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips. But their heart is far from me, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Here he quotes from Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 13. We also have a parallel to Matthew 15, verse 1 to 20, and Mark 7, verse 1 to 23. Here we learn that the following of the doctrines of men is brought forth of hearts that are far from God. Have you thought about that in this passage here? This teaches that those who would bring their doctrines and commandments in contrast to the Lord's have hearts that are far from God. Every human system that is an array unto God's way in the scriptures is born of hearts that are not close to God but far from God. And yet we have people to say that we should not condemn their error. Or say that they're wrong. But what did the Lord say? He said their heart is far from me. And he also teaches here that the doctrines of men cause worship to be vain. He said, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Moreover, we learn that these things are will worship. They are born of man's will and not God's will. In Colossians, the second chapter, verse 22 and 23, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of will, of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Paul declares to the young preacher Titus, that the commandments of men turn from the truth in Titus 1.14. Now what does the truth do for us? The truth, the word, is able to save our souls, James 1.21. The truth is what makes us free, Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8.32. The truth sanctifies man. Jesus prayed, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. John 17, verse 17. But just to see how evil the doctrines of men are, Paul, inspired of the Spirit by the authority of Jesus Christ, declares that the commandments of men turn souls away from the truth. Now, could anything be more evil than that? Than to turn a precious, eternal soul for which Christ died away from the truth. Now the Lord here presents a blanket statement to condemn all doctrines of men and all false doctrines. In Deuteronomy 4, 2, we are not to add unto the word of our Lord nor diminish out from it. And John warns before the close of the Bible in Revelation 22, 18 and 19, For I testify unto every man to hear the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book, and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. My friends, when we turn to John, the second chapter, we see how that Jesus went into the temple, and we have other accounts of this in the New Testament of Jesus doing this. In John chapter 2, beginning at verse 13, and the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, 
And that's from Psalm 69 in verse number 9. Now think about all the implications of the Lord's action here. Although they were not actually worshiping at this time, they were carrying on like this in the house of God, the temple. That's what they were doing. They were making merchandise of religion like many religionists do today during worship. They do things, they have performances, and they teach things to gain money and to have followers. This is a condemnation of making merchandise out of religion. But not only this, we see that by implication this condemns those who would use entertainment or other carnal means to make gain of religion or to have false teaching. The disciples observed the Lord's example. They said, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. My friends, today the church of our Lord is God's house. 1 Timothy 3, verse 15. He loved the church and gave himself up for it. Ephesians 5, 25. He purchased it with his own blood. Acts 20, verse 28. Should not we be consumed with zeal for the house of the Lord today? When we see preachers in the pulpit like these Brother Brown and these other faithful preachers here who get up zealously for the truth and oppose error, isn't that zeal for the Lord's house? When we see faithful and godly elders and faithful members of the church defend the truth, and spread the gospel and make sacrifice to do so, such as many brethren we have here tonight. Isn't that zeal for the Lord's house? Shouldn't we all have that zeal? Whether we're preachers or elders or not, men or women, we should all have zeal for the Lord's house. There are many examples in the brotherhood today of things going on in worship that we could talk about. For example, there are special singing groups. Choirs and choruses, where's the authority for that? There is none. We are to teach and admonish one another, Colossians 3.16. We are to speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, Ephesians 5.19. Sing and make your melody in our heart to the Lord. We have those who want to observe the Lord's Supper as a common meal. Or to observe the communion on another day besides the Lord's Day. We have those who clap and applause during worship. Where is the authority for that? There is none. There are those who want to have women leading prayer or even preaching during the worship or doing other leadership things. There is no authority for this in the New Testament. And there's one thing that I would like to especially bring out at this time. Because there are some congregations that at least were faithful and some that perhaps would be today if... They would leave these innovations alone. And that is the children's church or children's Bible hour during the worship. Now please understand everybody out there in internet land and here in the audience. I'm not talking about Sunday school. I'm not talking about vacation Bible school. I'm not talking about Bible class on Wednesday night or Lord's Day morning. I'm talking about during the worship. When a member of the church takes the children or the young people out of the worship assembly. You know, we read in Acts 4, 14, 27. They gathered the church together. We read in Hebrews 10, 25. We're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. When a faithful brother or sister in Christ or more than one or two or three go out of the worship assembly and take the children aside they are not in the worship assembly. They are in disobedience to God when it comes to worship. Amen. And moreover, not only this, but there is no authority for this practice in the New Testament. None whatsoever. And taking children um, out of the worship, even if they do not have so-called children's worship, but they have a special children's Bible hour, they call it. Or they may call it children's church. Or whatever you call it, it still is unauthorized by the Word of God. You know, we need to hear that message loud and long. 
This is how the devil gets into the church, things like this. Now, we hear the excuse, well, it trains the children. Well, what better way to train them than to bring them into the worship and see the parents and others worshiping God in spirit and truth and hearing faithful gospel preachers. You know, one thing I remember growing up is learning to love and admire faithful gospel preachers. That's good for a child. That's good for a young person. But you know, we want to segregate the congregation when it comes to worship. I don't mean brethren here, but there are many who are doing that. Where's the authority for it? There is none. We also hear, well, the, the parents can listen. They can learn better. You know, we can come up with all kinds of rationalization to do wrong. You know, in the mid-1800s, when the melodeon was introduced to Midway, Kentucky, they offered the excuse, well, the singing was so bad. Well, who said the singing was bad anyway? Some people say the Mormon Tabernacle Choir can really sing beautiful, but not to God's ears, mind you, because they're in transgression of God. You know, I, young, I know a young man back, back home that, you know, to hear him sing is something else. And he's loud, too. But, you know, I believe that young man is sincere. He's got some limitations, but he's sincere. God loves that. If we cannot even carry a tune in a bushel basket, so to speak, but we sing praise to God scripturally, God is pleased with that over the most beautiful sounds that man can make on instrument or voice, if he is doing things that are unscriptural, we need to understand that. That's worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Now I want to look at a few examples here of something that, uh, well, to me it's, it's amazing. This comes from the David Lipscomb University website. and You know, I, I really regret to have to use the late and faithful venerable brother David Lipscomb's name in connection with this university because he would have never gone along with the things that are going on there today. He would not have gone along with it. But from their website, one is invited to nurture 2013. Boy, these are catchy titles. In order to participate in a contemplative prayer service on February 26, 2013. Hey, that's Tuesday. It's coming Tuesday, isn't it? But I'm not going. <laughs> it's not far away from where I live either, but I'm still not going. And this is in the Ezel Center at Lipscomb. And I hope that family, if they don't agree with this, I hope that the family whose name's on that building will have something to say about it, but this is on the Lipscomb campus. The leader of the event will be Gordon T. Smith, preacher of the gospel. No, that's not what it says. President and professor of systematic and spiritual theology at Ambrose University College and Seminary affiliated with the Church of the Nazarene, no less. Now, <clears throat> it's not all, though. In 2013, the Institute for Christian Spirituality at Lipscomb will also sponsor a, quote, personal Ignatian retreat, opening to the presence of Christ in all things. This offering will assist participants in understanding and appreciating the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola. Presentations will include an overview of the four weeks of exercises, Ignatian prayer forms, and finding God in all things. Well, couldn't find him there, though. <laughs> it says Ignatian spirituality is rooted in the experiences of Ignatius Loyola, Loyola 1491 to 1556. This was a Roman Catholic priest, by the way, who founded the group known as the Jesuits. To learn about Loyola, a sectarian priest, so-called, was chosen, Marshall Craver, the associate director of St. Paul's Episcopal Church, Mobile, Alabama. Can you believe this? We're going to study a Roman Catholic priest at the foot of Episcopalian. 
And they're going to say you can find God in all this. You can find out how to leave God in it. And how to depart from the truth. Indeed, they have turned away their ears from the truth and have turned unto fables. But then, if that is not enough, one can pay $1,999 and participate in another program by Lipscomb Spirituality Institute called Growing Deeper. Well, that's an ironic title. A year-long program of study intended to encourage and enhance the spiritual practices of prayer, contemplation, and service. The leaders will be two women. Jacqueline Heilstad, the Associate Director of ICS and Associate Professor of Spiritual Formation at Lipscomb. She specializes in working with clergy. There's the language of Ash Dodd for you. And their families. The other is Rhonda Lowry, who, among other things, is described as, quote, adjunct professor of spiritual formation at Fuller Theological Seminary, a frequent leader of spiritual retreats, a recurrent speaker at Laity Lodge in Texas, a senior fellow with the Institute for Christian Spirituality at Lipscomb University, and, don't miss this, is a faculty member in the College of the Bible. So they got a woman on the Bible faculty at Lipscomb. And I don't think they're saying for women only in these things. I know they're not. They're inviting the public to pay for this. Is there any doubt but where they have gone in regard to what Paul taught regarding the role of women? 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Isn't it good that we've got these godly women here during this lectureship to teach the ladies? But the men are not invited to come to those classes. Now, I know they have great classes, but the men won't be there. That's because of what Paul taught right here in 1 Timothy 2. But now further. Indeed, these have turned unto fables. You know, friends, all this time, haven't we been... Pitifully deluded. All the time, all this time, we thought we were supposed to be studying Christ. Now he prayed. And the apostles, such as Paul in Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. And Jesus in John 17. But now we are we glad to learn that we need to sit and learn about Ignatius and how he prayed? Of course, I'm speaking here in irony. The Lord and His apostles in the Scriptures, that's how we learn to pray. And we can do that without paying $1,999. Now, one more thing. Alas, there are more programs in apostasy to partake of at LU. One can pay a measly $3,999, and this time, and feed on more soul-condemning error. It is a fitting name, spiritual direction program, by accepting this diet of damnable heresy, 2 Peter 2, 1, one spiritual direction will surely not be the narrow way to eternal life. The direction will be away from Christ and into apostasy. This time will be the Jackie House said, they can't leave her out, and Randy Harris, a well-known apostate from Abilene Christian University. My friends, are these people who claim to be Christians, are they interested in the doctrine of Christ? Or are they interested in following men? I believe we should see that it's rather obvious what they are interested in. And it's not following the doctrine of Christ. John said, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. As we come to a conclusion this evening, I would like to look at um, John chapter 4 for a moment, in verses 23 and 24. Here Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit 
and in truth. A lady in the Lord's Church uh, in Portsmouth, Virginia, where I preached several years ago, she told me one day, she said, and she had been a member of the Christian church, she said, I used to think the church of Christ was boring. I'm talking about the worship. He said, now I'm in, you can't drive me out. You know, she'd been converted to the truth. She came to understand what true worship is all about. You know, we don't have to lower the lights, and have incense and tingling bells and all this to get in the mood to worship. You know, when I go out to Arlington Cemetery where my mother and father's body are buried, you know, I don't, I don't have to have something to get me in the mood when I go out there. When I go out to their gravesite, I get in the mood real quick. You know, when we come together to worship God, whom we should be loving with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and with our brothers and sisters in Christ, whom we should be loving with a pure heart fervently, we shouldn't have to have these superficial things to get us in the mood. Because God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Thank you. Yeah, just no other way around it. That's a great sermon. I'm just so sorry we have to hear about these apostasies, but that's the reality. We can't run from reality. We have to face it. And Brother Danny's a good one to do that. You know, if we do as we're told as Christians and yield our body's living sacrifices, which is our reasonable service to God, and we do it every day of the week, you've got your mind in the right state when you come to worship on the first day of the week. It's these people who live according to the devil all week long that have to have some way or the other to crank their mind up to get some sort of emotional high to make them feel all right for a little bit, and then they'll trot right back to doing the devil's bidding for the rest of the week. That's exactly what happened. The closer you live to the Lord every day, you don't have to have all this rigmarole. I don't mind saying, and I hope it goes right on wherever it needs to go, I wouldn't give you a rotten fig for any one of the colleges right now as far as upholding the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of God's good word and the truth that sets us free from sin and keeps us within the boundaries faithfully of the church of Christ as that term is defined and used in the New Testament. Surely by now, after, and some of us know this firsthand, after the 1960s at least up to this point, those of us who have preached and kept abreast of things, we have seen the colleges go on and on and on and on away from the truth. And, of course, people who think the church can't exist without a college or something like that, then they swallow all that stuff hook, line, and sinker. Do you understand, and we'll stop here, do you understand why there were only a few people, eight souls, is that right, on the ark? Hmm? Somebody tell me it's eight. Yeah. Well, somebody said 12. I was wanting to know the other night if we, we, we got that straight. Because if I remember right, when you said you asked the question, they said 12. You said, well, that, that, you said 12. That said a whole lot to you, but you never did say how many was in there. <laughs> you, we assume that everybody knows it's eight. Souls were saved by water. How many... Thousands upon thousands of people were outside that ark. I don't know. But I know there were only eight in it, and they're the ones that love the Lord, and they kept His commandments. And so if we must be just the very few in comparison to all those out there that claim they're Christians, so be it. I, when the whole thing came to an end in those days with Noah, I guarantee you the few people in that ark wouldn't have bothered me to be with them because they're the only ones that were saved. I don't care what anybody else says. They were the only one that was saved. And let's keep that in mind 
when it comes to knowing the truth and doing it and sacrificing everything that we have and are rather than give up anything about it. Thank you very much. We're dismissed for about three seconds. Thank <laughs> you.